God, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to worship you. We are thankful for the structure. We are thankful for our fellow congregants here that we may praise you. We pray that what we worship here is found pleasing to your eyes and our music is pleasing to your ears. We also pray for servants such as Brother Dale to prepare messages and to present them to us so that we may become edified and we may serve you better. Be with us now as we go in there, in the, through this service, be with Brother Dale. May his words be your words. May they fall upon our ears, just as they did the day of Pentecost, so that we may understand, we may be better servants of yours. With all honor, glory, and praise being yours, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. single week they get bigger and bigger and more proficient and I appreciate their participation and, and thank you to each person that had a part in making our service meaningful this morning Amen. Justin it's good to have you with us this morning and we're going to share a little bit from the gospel of John we're going to talk about a passage that some people look at it as a difficult passage, but I look at it as clearing up a fuzzy picture. It's a beautiful passage giving man hope like he's never had before. A number of us are starting to age. And I talk with individuals who are around my age. And a common theme is anticipating glorious things in the kingdom of God. For me, there aren't as many years left to live as for Keith. Right, Lynette? Yeah. We hope. God is a giver of every good and perfect gift, and each one of us does what we can to good, take good care of ourselves, at least we think we do. Are we taking care of ourselves spiritually? If Jesus were to come tomorrow afternoon, would you be ready? Because we don't know when our last breath is going to be, I think it's important that we periodically look at where we stand in our relationship with God. God loves every single one of you. All of us are made in the image of God. And each of you are a blessing. God created this world for our habitation, for our ability to be able to have a place to live and serve and worship him. And yet the passage we're going to look at is one that some people get confused about. 
Some people look at it in a little bit different light. I'd like to clear up a fuzzy picture. The scripture is the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I'd like to look at the first 14 verses of John 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not that light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Who were, born, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look at this passage, open our minds, open our hearts, and Father, pour out the message that you want each person in this room to acquire. May you be glorified and be exalted while I diminish. In Jesus' name, amen. When God created the world, he did something very, very unique. He created heaven and earth, and he spoke the world, the world into existence. Now, everything Jesus spoke, everything Jesus did, may not be recorded. He lived 33 years. How many of you here are 33 years or younger? All right. Now, think about how much you've talked. How many books would it fill? How many pages? And yet we see in just a few short pages of scripture, the words spoken by Jesus during three years of ministry. If what we have in red in the scriptures is all Jesus said during his ministry, he was a pretty quiet individual. But I know, matter of fact, John says that there is more, for in John chapter 20, near the end of his, uh, of his gospel, 
He said, there are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. So there's things we don't know about, perhaps. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Now, what, David, keep that one right there. I've had the opportunity to pastor a number of churches as well as speak as a guest in others for pushing 50 years. And every year come around Easter, what do you think we talk about? Resurrection. So you might take a, a it, it's very easy to take a message that I prepared, prayed over, and delivered in 1979 that I pull out of the archives, rework, and present in 1992. And probably take that same message from Easter, maybe take a little off, add a little more, rework it, tweak it a little bit, and preach it again in 2013. In three years, I imagine Jesus used the same sermons or the same illustrations perhaps a number of times in sharing what he knew was important. If you want to, sh if you have a message about resurrection, and you want every person to know about resurrection, and you have an audience in Raymore, and you preach on resurrection in Raymore, and then all of a sudden you have an opportunity to preach to an audience in Sedalia, and you want them to know about resurrection, do you think you might use the same message? Probably. Particularly if you end up going to San Francisco and they want to hear a message on resurrection, you're going to preach the same message. Sure, it's a lot easier for you. But different people are hearing that message and it's the message of resurrection. And Jesus traveled all over during his three years. So there are many other things, signs and, that were performed things that Jesus may have said that's not written in the book. I want to examine this passage of John 1 where we're talking about creation. John is talking about creation. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the word was God. What does word mean? Do you have that slide? What does the word mean? In Greek, the word, W-O-R-D, is logos. If you want to write it down, it's number three zero five six in Strong's Concordance. It comes from three zero zero four, meaning something something said. It's it means something, something said, including a thought. Three zero zero four is Lego, meaning 
to lay forth, to relate in words, to express something. How did God create the heavens and the earth? He spoke it into existence. Did you know the word was working at that time? He spoke the world into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let dry land appear, and dry land appeared. W-O-R-D means something said. It's an idea. It's a thought. You can even use the word particular a plan. I often like to use it as a, as a blueprint, if you will. What existed in the beginning was part of God. It was God. His thoughts, his ideas, his speech, that was him. And he created. In the beginning was the word. There are different places where words are used in personification. Trees can clap. Clouds can cry. Wisdom talks. And when God created, the word is kind of is a kind of a personification for when God created, he created created everything. He created it in Genesis 1, 1 and 2. He created the heavens and the earth. And the word for create is bara, B-A-R-A, meaning to create. Bara is always used of God's created activity, never of human activity. The word bara indicated that creation was something brand new. God spoke everything into existence. God said, let there be light. Light occurred. What's interesting is that when God spoke the world into, create, into existence, Genesis 2, 1 and 2, say that God saw everything. The creation of heaven and earth were completed, and all their hosts, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day, from part of his work, right? Some of his work, all of his work, all of the work that he had done. I have in my office downstairs some blueprints which are of this building, architectural drawings of what was wanting, was what the desire was to, when this building was formed. When you build a house, one of the first things you do is get architectural drawings. This is where I want the living room. This is where I want the dining room. I want three bedrooms. They're here, here, and here. Oh, no, I want to move that. So you'll move something around. There are a number of churches that I've been in that when they build a brand new building, they've got their architectural drawings, they have the dedication for the building, and part in the architectural drawings that you see at the uh, dedication of the building is that the sanctuary that you're in will someday be changed to a gymnasium as they build another place a little bit bigger for that purpose. So the, the long-range goal is the current sanctuary, will be a gymnasium and we'll have a bigger place as we grow. That's the dream. That's the idea. That's the goal. That's the long-range plan. And when God created the heavens and the earth and he completed all his work, I believe it was not just separating light from darkness, day from night, 
but he also knew about the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. He knew about a time when there would be a need for a flood. He knew about a time when Israel would be so wicked that ultimately both tribes, both kingdoms, the northern and southern, both would go into captivity. He also knew about a time when, when the world got so bad as it was in the days of Noah that his son Jesus would come again. But he wasn't born yet. We talked about Abraham in Sunday school. Abraham was given promises by God. Promises that he believed in, trusted God for the results of having, being a great nation and he didn't have any kids. He didn't have any offspring yet, but he believed God. When God prepared everything and spoke the world into existence, he rested from all his work Acts 15 and verse 18, it says, The Lord, who makes these things known from long ago, God has known all things from the beginning. I had a young person ask me this week, it's kind of a hard concept to understand God never had a beginning. I said, yeah. It is sometimes difficult. It takes something called faith. Faith is believing without having the physical proof. I believe God exists, but I haven't seen him eyeball to eyeball. I believe Jesus died for my sins, but unlike Paul, the apostle, I haven't seen him eyeball to eyeball. But I believe that I will because the angels who were there at his ascension said he is coming again, the same one. God spoke. He had an idea. He had a plan. And the utterance was the Logos, his word. And when the fullness of time was come, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the world was ready, not 400 years too soon, not 400 years too late, when, when God knew the world was ready, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law. But he knew from the very beginning that it would be needed. Another interesting one, and I... I've alluded to this sometimes at Easter, but I want you to look at two different words from John's gospel dealing with sheep or lambs. Arnion, a properly, properly a young lamb, a little lamb, figuratively a person with pure innocence virgin-like, gentle intentions. John 1.15 is where Jesus confronts Peter, saying, do you love me? And he said, oh, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. But the word sheep or lamb in Greek has more than one meaning. When, you, when somebody says they love, that a neighbor and somebody, your neighbor and somebody from another state are getting married, they love each other. What's the word love really mean? Do, do they know? Do we know? What does the word love mean? It's, in Greek, it's got a number of meanings. Another word, strong number, 286 Amnos is a sacrificial lamb. 
you, a lamb used for sacrifice, a young sheep without blemish, especially a one-year-old lamb. That's one that's going to be killed. Two different words. But the second one is the one that John used in John 1, 29, when he said the next day he saw Jesus coming and he said to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A specific word that the people then knew what that lamb was going to do. We say, you know, we've got a lot of lambs out here. Well, which one is it? Is it the one running around, the one that's going to be killed? We don't know. Jesus had a beginning, and it was when the fullness of time was come. The fullness of time is an exclusive term referring to all that God, in his eternal wisdom, had seen necessary to take place before the right time would come for his son to be born. History records Jesus being born somewhere in our calendar days, 4 B.C. to 1 A.D., somewhere on that next one. John 1.14 says that the word became flesh. God spoke and something came into existence. God, the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary and Mary conceived. And what this means is the words of God, the plan of God, became a physical reality. The blueprint that was seen on paper has now become a physical thing. You've seen the blueprint, suddenly you've got the edifice that you can come in and enjoy in winter and summer. It's got heat, it has indoor bathrooms, it has kitchen, it has a place to worship. It's no longer just something on a piece of paper that you can look at and say, boy, I hope this happens. The plan of God from the beginning of creation became a reality when Jesus was born. God's words became flesh. Jesus Christ. And he dwelt among us. And John says, we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God spoke, the Logos became a reality in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God's plan, in another way, the Logos literally took shape. God's plan for the world, a sinless individual who lived a sinless life and became the sacrifice for you and me. Why did we need a Savior? We needed somebody that could pay the debt for our sin. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, Joseph is told what, his, uh, what this child that's going to be born is going to do. Now keep in mind, we're, we are in 2019 and reading the words of Scripture. Things that were said to Joseph centuries ago. She will bear a son, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You need to understand that when Joseph was told these words, in his day and time, he knew what it meant to save someone from their sins because what they had up to that time was animal sacrifice. Somebody was going to have to die. And that's why the distinguishing term for lamb. When John saw Jesus, he used a specific word. The people were looking for a king that's going to come and restore the kingdom to Israel. John saw him as the one that was going to be dying for the sins of the world, the sacrificial lamb. 
and he used the word that meant that. John knew what Jesus' job was. He was going to die. What John also saw, which is very unique, he saw the crowds following Jesus. He heard or saw some of the miracles. And so when he was in, in prison, he sent an entourage of his own to Jesus with the question, are you the one that is to come? Jesus didn't say, yep, I am, or no. He just simply said, they, go back and tell John the things that you see happening. The dead are being raised, the blind are see, receiving their sight, the deaf are hearing. And those things were samples of the kingdom of God. Those were things the Messiah, the coming Messiah, was going to do. So by that, they went back and told John, John knew that Jesus was both the suffering Savior and the coming King. From what I can see in Scripture, he's basically the only one that really got it. He knew that one man would do both. Most of the rest of the people, that's why, that's why they rejected him. You're not the one we're looking for. John knew he was going to do both. And Jesus said, there's no greater one than John. Jesus died and gave his life a ransom for many. Now, I'm going to close with this. Some people believe that since the word became flesh and what became a reality at that time was Jesus, that the word has to refer to Jesus. Look at the meanings of these words. Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -S. And the Greek is Jesus. That's his name. The word Christ is Christos. It's a title. W-O-R-D does not mean, is not translated as Jesus. It's logos. And it means something expressed, something said. So you see, the word became a reality. It became, uh, when God spoke, the word became light. The word darkness suddenly uh, it was different from light. The firmament above and below were separated when God spoke. The animals were created when God spoke. And when God spoke, and carried out his plan. Jesus was born from the womb of Mary. It's a beautiful passage. It gets so confused, convoluted, when it really is so simple. Jesus was in God's plan, in his mind, planned from the very beginning. I've asked couples when I conducted premarital counseling, how much money do you, would you like to make? We tried to do a little bit of financial planning. How many kids would you like? It's interesting when you ask him separately and then ask her separately, you might get two over here and four over there. We're going to have three kids, Lord willing. That's our plan. But they're not there yet. They're not in existence yet. Matter of fact, they're not even married yet. 
He's living in Chicago, and the other one's living in New York. They're not even together. But they're planning a marriage. They're going to get together. They're going to make a family. And once they come together as husband and wife, it's going to take about another nine months before that first one would even show up. But our plan is this. And we've got our starter house. But we want to buy some land in the, uh, out in the country. And we'd like this, we'd like this, we'd like this. They have their dreams, they have their plans. That's their logos. And God spoke. And the world is what it is today. It's a beautiful passage. Song number 31. <laughs> 